Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dominic Turpin, the president of IMD, and I'm really happy to see a full house today for our speaker today, Sadhguru. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, Alessandro will say a few words about uh, your, who you are, your background, and, and your mission. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all the people who have been here, because today it's a bit unusual. I understand we have some MBA, some participants from the product for executive development, a number of alumni that I want to thank also, uh, staff, of course. So we have a full house, which is a bit unusual, but great news. It means that you know, there is a lot of interest for uh, what you're going to talk about. So this morning, we, we met about an hour ago, and I, I must say that uh, this morning, I was wondering what I'm going to talk about with the yoga. And, so, you know, I, came, I went to this meeting a little bit anxious. What kind of conversation are, are we going to have? But I, I must say that we had a longer discussion than what was planned. And I was extremely happy to see that we are sharing a lot of very common ele elements regarding, you know, what is leadership, what are the fundamentals of business education. And we had such a great uh, discussion that I think we are going to start doing things together. So that was a very productive meeting for me and also, I guess, for Sadhguru. So without further ado, I'm going to leave the floor to Alessandro, who is going to give us a little bit of background on, on Sadhguru. So as I was preparing to welcome our guest today, I reminded myself to be as short as possible so you all can enjoy this, uni that, this unique event and talk. But to introduce Sadhguru, Yagi Vasudev, in a short manner, is not so simple, as his work and impact sp spread to so many areas of society and life. Let me try and give you some highlights. Described as a yogic, mystic, and humanitarian, Sadhguru is the founder of the Isha Foundation, an organization that taps the unsigned science of yoga to deliver programs that create physical mental and emotional well-being. Programs that have today been attended by five million people around the world. To give you an idea of the management challenge, the organization is operated by a network of two million volunteers worldwide. Sadhguru is also a social entrepreneur who has pioneered mobile health clinics and rural Olympic Games in South India, opened various networks of schools, and even won a Guinness Book World Record in the number of trees planted in one day, more than 800,000. He's at the origin of a massive popular movement in South India, where he now gives programs that are, that are attended by 30,000 people at a time in cities like Bangalore, Cochin, or Chennai. He has been named one of the top 50 Indians by India Today magazine. And if that weren't enough, Sadhguru also writes poems and is ready to challenge you at a game of golf in between his international travels. Sadhguru is not our typical guest on the IMD campus. However, he has visited Switzerland many times before as he's a regular guest at the meeting at the, world, at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum in Davos. He also has given a TED talk, spoke at the United Nations, the India Economic Summit, the Tarbuck Forum, and many other conferences. His interviews are featured in the New York Times, BBC, Bloomberg, CNN, and he also, has, he also runs a column, the Huffington Post. Maybe it is so difficult to cover the many hats that Sadhguru wears, because he is, as he says himself, in the one and only business there is, the business of human well-being. And God knows how vast a topic that is. Really, when we say at MD that we are in the business of education, management, entrepreneurship, and leadership, we too are fundamental in the business of human well-being. This is why we feel extremely lucky today to welcome someone who lives and works at the cutting edge of a common discipline. Sadhguru, you are perfect examples of our own values, and it is our privilege and pleasure to welcome you on campus today. Smaranam 
question would naturally be, what is that prayer about? It's not a prayer, it's an invocation. An invocation means there is a whole technology as to how to organize your system to do a particular action. As human beings, we do so many things in our lives. You want to run a race, your body, your brain, your energy needs to be in a certain way. You want to meet a friend, it needs to be in another way. You want to do something else which needs your intellect on, it needs to be in another way. Like this, for different types of activities that we perform in our life, we need to have our system in a certain way. A lot of people are managing to make it happen naturally or the situation will slowly set them in. People will enter a situation unprepared, gradually the situation will mold their mind, their energies and everything to function well there. But there is a way that you can consciously create an inner situation where you craft that situation within yourself so that you're organized in every way, all the faculties within you, your body, your mind, your emotion and your energy is properly organized for that specific activity. There is a whole science and technology as to how to go about this inner organization within a human being. When we say uh, a leader or when we say ambition, ambition is just an exaggeration of the existing. When we say vision, as the word suggests, it is about a new possibility, something which is not yet. Ambition is about wanting to take as much as we can take. Vision is about making everything yours. One is an aggressive way of taking it, another is an embrace. It is like the distinction between love and rape, both seem to the same for external viewers, but it's a world of difference. Making the world yield to you willingly and trying to take a piece of the world are two different dimensions of life. As human beings, like never before, we are empowered. Individual human beings, we have become so pow powerful because of technological advancement. What 10,000 men could do thousand years ago, today one man can do. When we are so hugely empowered, it's extremely important that the way we exist here is in a more inclusive way. All this philosophy, is it possible for a businessman? It is very much possible and especially not possible, it is very much needed for the businessman because business is about expansion. Does expansion happen because of inclusiveness or does expansion happen because you forcefully take something? If you forcefully take something, you will never expand to the full capacity. Only if you learn how to make the world yield to what you want it to be, only then you can take it all. Ambition is about more. Vision is about all. When it's a leadership, a leader is somebody who is trying to create a situation and people are looking up to him, believing that he's going to make it happen. So th that means he must be in some position within himself that he is able to see things better than the people around him. Business leadership or managing large situations, if you want to manage 1,000 people, Essentially, you are managing 1,000 minds. 
if you want to manage 1,000 minds, if you are not even able to manage your own mind, it is going to be accidental management. And because of this accidental management, you will see managers of the world are the most tense-looking human beings. We are sending a completely wrong message to the world. If you succeed, you will suffer. This is the message that's going to the world. It happened in the 60s in America because all the successful people are so miserable, the youth did not see that success is worthwhile. They thought just sitting on a street corner and smoking pot is much better, at least we are happy. So this is a very wrong message that success is a bad thing, is a horrible message for humanity and the future generations to come. Right now, this message is going out because you will see successful people hard look, uh, have the most miserable places, uh, faces on the planet. Success is, should be a sweet thing, but success has become a suffering simply because we are managing to do outside things without doing anything about ourselves. If the work that you are doing is important, the first thing that you need to do is work upon yourself. What does working upon yourself mean? See, as you sit here, each human being is his own, simply because of the accumulation of experiences that have happened in different people and how all this is assimilated within each person. Each human being is his own, and that's the beauty of human beings. You can't find a carbon copy anywhere. Everybody is unique. This uniqueness will be a wonderful thing if it functions cohesively. The same uniqueness, if it does not function cohesively, this uniqueness has to be called your really unique means, that means you're a freak. Only if this uniqueness functions cohesively, this uniqueness can be celebrated and enjoyed and the world can benefit from this and the individual can benefit from this. Our idea of success has become like this right now. That we are sitting, you know, there's a proverbial story in India about a man sitting on a tree branch and cutting it, but sitting on the wrong end of it. If he succeeds, he will fail. Right now, we have brought the world to such a situation that if we succeed, we will fail. In 2008, when I was uh, at the World Economic Forum, <laughs> the recession was just beginning, and uh, I saw all this... 2,000 and more people who are hugely successful people carrying very long faces. Recession is coming, recession is coming. So they asked me to handle a session called recession and depression. <laughs> I said recession is bad enough, you don't have to get depressed on top of it. <laughs> and uh, the way we have created this whole situation is such, if we if we fail, we will be depressed. If we succeed, we will be damned. That's how we have created the situation. If all the 7 billion people on this planet use modern technology and get super busy, I think the planet just has 10, 15 years left. Fortunately, 50% of the people are lazy. Really. <laughs> Now, it's not human intelligence which is saving the planet. It is not human love or compassion saving the planet. It is human lethargy which is saving the planet. That's a shame, isn't it? <laughs> Simply because our ideas of success, our ideas of well-being itself has not been consciously worked at. It's just like we have just grown like wilderness. Now, today, leadership means that we are able to re-engineer our very idea of success, well-being in the world. If we don't do this now, the success will be a bad thing. All the younger generations are becoming activists who are against any kind of successful activity on the planet. I was, I happened to be in a conference in London, a major conference, almost 3,000 people participating, all kinds of people. And uh, this is about be the change. And here all kinds of things were going on and I was listening with great apprehension for what things that were being said. One man has come from India, he's brought 
10 tribals from India carrying one one bag of tea. He said, see, I have brought the producer himself to UK and they are going to sell their tea bags right here and they're going to take their money. Nobody in between, no corporations, nothing, no cash, direct. I said, when my turn to speak him, I said, it's okay. I don't mind buying a tribal tea, but I fly Lufthansa. I don't want to fly a tribal airline <laughs> where two out of the four engines are working. The idea of creating corporations and businesses was to make our life more efficient, not monstrous. It will become monstrous if we function out of individual ambition rather than a larger vision. Somehow get there. This is the way of the ambition. Somehow get there. We'll work only short term. Can I tell you a story? Can I tell you a story? Yeah. I seek your permission because it is probably just post-lunch for many of you and uh, the moment I say once upon a time, a lot of people think it's bedtime. <laughs> it's not. On a certain day, a bull and a pheasant were grazing upon the field. The bull eating the grass, the pheasant picking ticks off the bull partnership business. There was a huge tree at the edge of the field. The pheasant nostalgically looked at the tree and said, Oh, alas, there was a time I could fly to the topmost branch of the tree, but now I don't have enough strength in my wing even to fly to the first branch of the tree. The bull very nonchalantly said, That's no issue. Eat a little bit of my dung every day. Within a fortnight, you will reach the top of the tree. The pheasant said, Come on, what kind of nonsense is that? The bull said, Really, try and see the whole humanity is on it. The pheasant hesitantly started picking at the down and lo, on the very first day it reached the first branch of the tree. Within a fortnight it did reach the topmost branch of the tree. It sat on the topmost branch of the tree beginning to enjoy the scenery. An old farmer who was rocking in the rocking chair saw a fat old pheasant sitting on top of the tree, pulled out his shotgun and shot the bird off the tree. The moral of the story is, many times bullshit can get you to the top, but it will never let you stay there. <laughs> if, if an external observer looks at our world, the human activity, over a span of a few hundred years and looks at what we have done with the ourselves, this will be our story. We just somehow made it and then collapsed. This is, it is no more about somehow making it. We are right now allowing social and other environments to shape human consciousness. No, human consciousness should shape our business environment, the social environment, and the world's environment. Instead of allowing the human consciousness to do the other, right now we are allowing the circumstances to change the human consciousness. The essence of being human is every other animal adapts to its situation. We can create our situations. This is the fundamental of being human. Otherwise, we are no different from any other creature on this planet. Everybody else is capable of adapting. We are capable of crafting the situations that we want. Now, leadership means just this, that we have a vision to craft the situation where everybody can fit in and everybody can prosper and our ideas of prosperity has to change because right now, if we have to provide what an average American citizen has to 7 billion people, the living earth statistics says that we need four and a half planets. We just have one and there's another one, 8 million Light years away, if you're up for the travel, there's just one more, another two and a half we need to find somewhere. So our success itself is working against us. This is not a good thing. If we do well, we will do badly. This is not a good way to craft our situations because our idea of doing well is just being a little better than yesterday. Just being a little better than yesterday is not doing well. This happened in 1910. There was a man in India. His name was Topiwala. 
Popiwala means a hat seller. Now you have this culture here also, that somebody's second name happens to be his profession, carpenter, goldsmith, blacksmith, whatever. Like that, he is a hat seller, he is a Topiwala. He was going from village to village in tropical heat, selling hats. One afternoon he's tired, sat under a tree, opened his meager lunch, ate and dozed off. When he opened his eyes, he looked, all the hats were gone. He looked all over the place, no hats, they're just gone, disappeared. If you do everything that you can do and it doesn't work, what do you do? Usually look up in prayer. So he looked up. There he saw a bunch of monkeys all sitting with hats on. He screamed at them. They screamed back at him. He abused them. They abused in their own language. He picked up whatever he could and threw it at them. They picked up whatever they could and threw it back at him. Not knowing what to do, frustrated, he took his hat and flung it on the ground. All the monkeys took their hats and flung it on the ground. <laughs> he picked up his hat and went about his business. 2012, 23rd of September, another Topiwala, going from village to village, selling hats. He came in the afternoon, sat under a tree, opened his elaborate lunch, 21st century. Had his lunch, promptly fell asleep. When he opened his eyes, hats were gone. He didn't look here and there, he looked straight up. The monkeys were sitting with hats on. He got up and jived. They all jived. He made funny faces. They made funnier faces. He had all the fun he wanted to have. When he was done, he took his hat and flung it on the ground. One baboon of a monkey quickly came down the tree, picked up the hat, <laughs> walked up to him, gave him a tight slap in the face, and told him, you idiot, you think only you had a grandfather? <laughs> so, just one step ahead of us today is not leadership. Leadership has to craft. Today, we have come to a place where the economic leadership has moving into a certain position in the sense. About 300 years ago, Largely religious leadership was controlling the world. From mindlessness of religious leadership, we moved into the tyranny of the military leadership. From the tyranny of the military leadership, we moved into the confusion of democratic leadership. Confusion and incompetence of democratic leadership in many ways. Because 100 people are running to the, trying to run the place, in India it's 542 people trying to run the nation. By the time you make these 542 people understand what is needed and what should be done tomorrow morning, it will take five years. And they are not there by then. So today we are moving into a place where in the next 10, 15 years time, the economic leadership will be the most important leadership in the world. We are definitely going there. The good thing about the business leader is, he has no qualms about anything. If there is a good deal, he will make a deal with the devil. He has no prejudices about anybody. You are white, you are black, you are yellow, you are this, you are that, he has no issues. He will make a deal with the devil if the deal is good. So, the economic leadership is, in many ways, in the very nature of things, it is very flexible leadership. If we train this leadership, if we bring about, now an institution like this and many others, if we bring about the necessary shift from economic leaders operating out of narrow personal ambitions to a larger vision, that will be the greatest thing for the future generations of the world, where a clear message that success is the sweetest thing in your life. Success is not a miserable thing. This message has to go. If this message has to go, economic leaders need to do something about themselves. They're doing a lot about many things. They need to do something about themselves. When I say doing something about yourself, why is it important? Do you see me? Are, you, are we in talking terms or is there an issue? Are we in talking terms? 
Do you see me? Yes. Use your hands and point out where I am. Ah, you got me wrong. You know I'm a mystic from India? <laughs> now, this light is falling upon me, reflecting, inverted image, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. Don't you know the whole story? Where, where do you see me right now? Within yourself, isn't it? Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Everything that you have ever known and experienced is only happening within you. Right now, if somebody next to you touches you, you think you're feeling their hand, but that is not the reality. The reality is you're experiencing the sensations within your own hand. You cannot feel the other hand. You are completely incapable of experiencing anything of the outside. The way it is projected within you, that is the only way you will experience it. That is why what is light for you is darkness for some other creature. Suppose you and an owl sit together. You have owls in Switzerland? If you and an owl sit together and start an argument as to which is light and darkness, where will you go? Hmm? Endless argument, isn't it? Who is right? You or the owl? You or the owl? Who is right as to which is light and which is darkness? Huh? Both? If you're saying both, either you're in the diplomatic core <laughs> or you have a successful marriage. <laughs> These are two areas where you should learn to say both, both, both. <laughs> now I'm asking you, which is light? What you see is light or what the owl sees is light? Which is the real light? You don't know. The thing is, your sense organs have opened up as it is necessary for your survival. It is opened up as it is necessary for his survival. You really don't know what is what. You only know the world the way it is projected within you. So, working upon the inward nature of who you are is the most essential thing. If you are in any position of responsibility and power, it's extremely important you do something about this. Otherwise, it will give you completely wrong images which look right. I want you to look back on the history of this world. How many horrible things human beings have done to each other believing they were doing the right thing? Yes or no? At that time, when they did those horrible things, they really believed they were doing the right thing. They did not think they were doing the wrong thing. This happens because we have done nothing about the interiority. When I say interiority, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? Egg. egg. Chicken. So he had an egg for breakfast. But over the morning, this egg has transformed itself into a human being, isn't it? It goes into you and it's becoming a human body, isn't it so? Yes. If you eat a piece of bread, you eat a banana, what you call is your body is just accumulation of the food that you've eaten, isn't it so? Now, what a phenomena he is. He can make a chicken egg into a human being over the morning. If you ask Charles Darwin, this would take millions of years. <laughs> he can do it over the morning and every one of you can do it over the morning. So here, there is an intelligence here. There is a competence here which is capable of transforming a piece of bread or an egg or a banana or whatever into a human body. When I say human body, I'm not talking about you or me like this. This is the most sophisticated machine on the planet. Yes or no? Is the highest level of technology, isn't it so? Human body. Every other gadget that you see on the planet has come out of this. This is the gadget. This the gadget. Yes. You, you, you're too involved in the iPhone, you never looked at the eye. <laughs> this super gadget, with what kind of raw material are you manufacturing? With a chicken egg, with a banana with a piece of bread. So there is an intelligence here, there is a competence here, which is of that level. If only if you found access to this intelligence, even if a drop of this intelligence entered 
your daily life, you would live magically. People around you will think you are superhuman. There is no such thing as superhuman. People talk about being superhuman simply because they have not realized that being human is super. Being human is super because, see, he can make an egg into a human being, chicken egg. Is it not super? Is it superhuman or super? It's just super, isn't it? That you can make a chicken egg into a human being over the morning. If your digestion is good in three hours, otherwise four hours. <laughs> if you have a weak stomach, four hours, otherwise three hours. Fantastic, isn't it? Does this intelligence exist in everybody? We have mistaken that intelligence means thought. No. The intelligence in the body is so phenomenal that which is the very source of making this body happen is right now functioning within you and there is a way to find access to this. This is what we are offering as inner engineering process. And this inner dimension is needed the moment you are taking a position of leadership in the world, in whatever capacity. It is your fundamental business to see that first this one is fixed. Because once you are a leader, Every thought that you generate, every emotion that you generate, every action that you perform is going to impact millions of people. Once you have such a privilege in the world, I think leaders have this business that they have to do something about themselves. That the way they think, the way they emote, the way they act is not destroying the world in so many different ways. Maybe good intentions, good intentions alone will not produce results. It is the right kind of action with the right kind of consciousness that produces the necessary results. We are going with ambition right now. We think that's our only driving force. There's a, there's a beautiful story in Indian lore. A monkey goes into a house and it finds a jar full of nuts. So it puts its hand inside. It's a very narrow-necked bottle or a jar. It puts inside a handful of not want to take it out. It won't come. It's stuck. It has to let go some, but it's ambitious. It cannot let go even one nut. Pulls and pulls, it doesn't come. Then another wise monkey comes. Some monkeys are wise, you know. Another wise monkey comes and says, this is another way you live it. And together, they overturn the jar and all the nuts are out. Now, we have to move from more to all. If you journey from more to all, that means you have traveled from ambition to vision. If you have questions, any kind of questions. <clears throat> so good that uh, as I heard you, if I understood you uh, good, you know, the, 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 change, the change can only happen by individual action. There is no sh a social movement, so a political movement with collective action. You have, um, your, 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 your thought is only um, a thought of individual one or, or not. So I want you to look at this properly. There is no such thing as society. There is you, me, and that person, and that person, and that person. Together, we give it a name called society. But there is no such thing in existence. It's only in our perception, isn't it? In reality, there's you and me, you and me, and you and me, and you and me, so many. You think there is a society. There is no such thing. Everybody's individuals. If ten individuals behave properly, you think, oh, this society is wonderful. No, society is not wonderful. There are ten individuals who are doing wonderful things. If a million individuals do really wonderful things, then you say this is a fabulous society. There is society is not functioning wonderfully. Individual people are doing wonderful things. That is why society gets the benefit, isn't it? But actually there is no society. It is just a word. It doesn't exist. It's individuals. If you want to transform a society, you have to transform the individuals. How else? You can make one mass teaching. Even if you make a mass teaching, still 
to what extent each individual takes it, that is the extent you find the result, isn't it? Now, as a humanity, when there is no society, is there a humanity? There isn't, there are only human beings. But as human beings on this planet, we are entrusted with a certain responsibility right now as a generation of people. Why I'm saying this is, for the first time, for the very first time in the history of humanity, we have come to a place where we have the necessary capability, resource and technology to address every human problem on the planet. Nourishment, health, education, whatever, whatever, name it. For everything, we have resource, we have capability and technology. The only thing that is missing is individual human beings who will stand up and make it happen. Yes or no? Never before this was possible. Twenty-five years ago, even if you dreamt of it, we were not capable. But now we are capable. If we are not capable of doing something, that is fine. If we are capable of doing something and if we do not do it. If we do not do what we cannot do, there is no issue. But if we do not do what we can do, we are a disastrous generation, isn't it? It's my wish and my blessing that we should not become a disastrous generation. We we should be able to turn it around because everything else is on the plate. Only the man is missing, isn't it? Do you see everything else is on the plate? Only the man is missing. Earlier it was not like that. There was no resource, there was no technology, there was no capability. Now everything is there, only you and me. You are, um, you are speaking, uh, you are speaking to, to an adult audience today and asking adults to change is obviously more difficult to uh, address the problem on an earlier stage. How would you, how would you recommend to, to have the children changing at, at an earlier stage and having them doing something else than playing with, uh, <coughs> with the iPhone? <laughs> <laughs> In your perception, do you believe a child is more supposed to be more sensible and intelligent or an adult is supposed to be more sensible and intelligent? What do you think? A child? That's a dangerous perception. <laughs> the reason why everywhere in the world the laws are made like this, even if a child commits murder, we will not punish him as we punish an adult is because there is a margin, because he's still growing, he doesn't, his faculties are not fully there, he's not fully responsible for his actions, isn't it? Yes or no? That's the reason why everything in the world is structured like that. So, to put it in the right perspective, we're definitely expecting adults to behave more sensibly and more intelligently than the child. The child is given a Huge margin because he's not it there. He is human. He is humanity in the making. You're a human being. So if you think it's an adult's prerogative to be rigid, unflexible, this is how I am. I thought this is only an Indian problem. <laughs> In India, there are many people. You tell them something. You say, "I'm like this only." Now you are saying we are like this only. No, no, no. You are not like this only. It is just that to dissolve your rigidity, you have not found a solvent. I will give you a solvent. We can dissolve your rigidity. Right now, your rigidity has come to your body because of a certain lifestyle and because of certain attitudes to your mind. Nothing else. Your body and mind. Let's look at it this way. This is too little a time to look at this aspect, but I want you to think about it. Your body, your physical body, over a period of time you gathered, isn't it so? It's an accumulation. Eggs, bread, bananas, this, 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 this. Body you accumulated or no? Why are we not on talking terms? I came all the way to speak to you. <laughs> Is body an accumulation? Yes. yes. What you call as your mind is an accumulation of impressions. Yes? What you accumulate can be yours. I will not dispute that for now. 
but cannot be you, isn't it? I am speaking now using this microphone. Suddenly I say, this is my microphone. You will think, oh, Sadhguru's got some problem. <laughs> After some time I say, this is me. Then you will say, let's go. Let's attend Martha's class. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> if I claim this microphone is me just because I'm using it, would you think I'm insane or not? Yes. Right now you're doing this every day. Food appears on your plate. You say, this is my food. You eat it and then you say, this is me. You need to look at this. I'm trying to do this shortcut. It's not a good way to do it. But I want you to think about it. What is not you? If you think it is you, what is not you? If you think it is you, even the medical explanation for insanity is that. Yes or no? The medical definition of insanity is, if I think I'm the microphone, the psychiatrist will say, you need treatment. Yes or no? What you gather can be yours, can never ever be you, isn't it? So there is something that gathers all this, that is an intelligence which can make a yag into a human being. Should you not access it? Should you not make that dimension of intelligence possible? I am not asking you to change. I am not asking you to change. Change is just a little improvement of the past. I am not asking you to change. I am telling you, as a human being, you are come with a potential which is enormous. When I say enormous, it, about two years ago, the cell phone companies in India did a survey. India is one of the big, not one of the, the biggest growing cell phone industry growing right now. 60 million phones we're adding per year. So the companies uh, made a survey and they found 97% of the people are using only 7% of a cell phone's capability. This is, we're not talking about your smartphones, the dumb phone. Of the dumb phone, 97% of the people are using only 7% of its competence. So they must be cont contemplating, even if you remove 90% of the software, most people will not know. 3% complaints, we can handle it. <laughs> Business, you know. Now, if a simple gadget like a cell phone, if we are using only 7% of its competence, what do you think is the percentage of this super gadget we are using right now? I don't want to talk percentages. It's too low to talk about. <laughs> you, you're comparing the, the body and the mind. And in fact, for the body, whatever you eat, the body will select which is good for you and will evacuate, which is not useful. How does the mind evacuate? The mind is also doing this, but its decision-making may not be as good as the body's <laughs> because a part of it has been handed over to you. If the mind was not in your hands, suppose the digestive process is not in your hands, you put something, the stomach itself will decide what to take, what to throw out. But now in the mind, you choose. So that's why it's a mess up. <laughs> what should go out is not there. But even now, there is a certain selection in the mind. See, everything that your five sense organs come in touch with in wakefulness and sleep is recorded in your mind. Suppose you walk from here to there, Actually, there may be 25 different types of smells. Everything is recorded. You won't feel it. Consciously, you will not know it. Only if somebody smells really bad or really good, you will know. Otherwise, if you just walk like this, there are 300 smells floating around in this hall. Every one of them is recorded in your mind. To what extent means? Suppose you're fast asleep. Let's say you're fast asleep. I come into your room and it's peak in an Indian language of which you have no clue, but you're fast asleep, you didn't even hear. 
But 20 years later, let's say I spoke 20 sentences, 20 years later we can hypnotize you and make you speak those 20 sentences in a language that you do not know. Experiments like this have been done. So everything is being recorded, whether wakefulness or asleep. But still, all of it is not in your memory, conscious memory. All of it is not finding expression in your life. But all of it is influencing you one way or the other. So I want you to know, even with food, what your body absorbs also has impact on the food. What your body rejects also has impact on your, food, on your system. What, what your body rejects, don't think it has no impact. It has impact on your system. So we hear in the video that you or Isha Foundation has four million, two millions of volunteers. My question is, how do you manage to to attract them? If anybody has to go crazy, it's me, <laughs> because doing all this activity, running various institutions, do you know, creating huge events on a daily basis all over. And making this happen with volunteers means I want you to understand what it means to work with volunteers. Nobody is trained for the job. That's the first thing. <laughs> you try to do something like this here, you will know what it is. And the next thing is you can't fire them. They're volunteers. <laughs> if the ability to fire people is taken away from you, you manage people and see, you cannot fire anybody for incompetence. So what happens is, in a corporation, what you can do with one word, I do the same thing with 100 words because I have to win over this person. Otherwise, she won't do what she has to do. But the efficiency with which we function, you come and see. We are super efficient in everything. Far more efficient than most corporations. That's why they're coming to us for training. I was conducting a, a, a program, a three-day event, for the top 30 executives of Microsoft India. And I had about eight volunteers. They were running around doing everything. After two days, these executives, their mouth watered. You know, they're always looking for attrition <laughs> elsewhere. They said, Sadhguru, where do you find these people? I said, you don't find them. You have to make them. How do you make them? I said, you have to make them fall in love with you. How do you do that? I said, first you have to fall in love with them. They said, oh, they don't pay us for that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how it is. When people are passionately involved, everything is a mess, but with, with simple adjustment, you can do wonderful things because human beings are functioning at hundred percent. Nobody is trying to hold back anything. Everybody is trying to do their best. Many times their best is quite burdensome. <laughs> but that's a whole thing. So, managing a situation like this, anybody can go crazy. But I will not go crazy because that one thing I fixed. What we have fixed is just this. See, for example, human experience goes through various things. Every human experience, for example, let's say peace. Suppose you lost your peace today. What happens? You go home and uh, people at home, the family gets the first dose, usually. If it continues, tomorrow you may pick a quarrel on the street. If it continues, you go and yell at your boss. The moment you yell at your boss, everybody knows that you need medical treatment. When you yelled at the family, they thought it's normal. If you start yelling in a situation where it will have serious consequences for you, people know you need treatment. So you go to a doctor. Initially, the doctor tries to talk you out and it doesn't work. Then he throws a pill into you. Pill means what? Little bit of chemicals. Little bit of chemicals, suddenly you become peaceful. Maybe not forever, at least for a short period of time. Or in other words, what you call as peace is a certain kind of chemistry. What you call as joy is another kind of chemistry. Blissfulness is another kind of chemistry. Ecstasy is one kind of chemistry. Agony is another kind of chemistry. Turmoil is another kind of chemistry. Anxiety and fear are other kinds of chemistries. Whole human experience, a range of human experiences are different chemical bases.
with the new. Now we are talking about the technology of creating the right kind of chemistry. You are in a chemistry of blissfulness. Doesn't matter what the situations are, you are at your best. Right now, people's logic is this, the situation is going wrong, I will also go wrong. This is a way to exist. Especially if situations are going wrong, it's all the more important that you are on the track, isn't it? Once you establish your way of being and it cannot be disturbed by what's around you, one thing that has happened to you is you are free of suffering. Once the fear of suffering is gone in your life, only then you will walk full stride in your life. Otherwise, every step that you take is a half a step. What will happen to me? If this doesn't work, what will happen to me? So just to give you an example, uh, in 1998, certain experts from the United Nations came to South India and they made a prediction. By 2025, Tamil Nadu, the state where we are, 60% of this state will become a desert. I didn't like predictions. I don't like any kind of predictions. Because predictions about individual human beings or societies are being made without taking into account what is beating in the human heart. Only statistics. Looking at today's numbers, you're saying tomorrow's numbers will be like this. I said, I don't like this. And I drove around. I wanted to see for myself if it's true. I drove across Tamil Nadu just to see if it's real. Then I saw that what they said was wrong because it's going to happen much quicker than 2025. Then I came back and said, what to do? Then I saw in Tamil Nadu, there was only 16% green cover. The national aspiration is 33%. Then I made a simple barefoot calculation. For the area that we have, if we plant 114 million trees in 6 to 8 years' time, in 15 to 20 years, we'll have 33% green cover. So I called a group of people and said, we need to plant 114 million trees. They said, Sadhguru, do you know what's 114 million? How can anybody plant 114 million trees? Then I said, see, what's your population? 62 million. If all of us plant one tree today, Take care of it for two years. Plant one more. How many do you have? You got the number. Even a beggar on the street can plant a one tree. He'll have an office growing for himself. He'll have an office space growing from him himself if he grows a tree, isn't it? <laughs> a growing office space. So today, we have, you know, it's like uh, almost 12 years now, we have planted 16 0.7 million trees, living trees, not just saplings, living trees. And this year we're planting six more million trees. And Tamil Nadu's green cover has gone up by 7.2%. It's the only place in the whole of Asia where the green cover is actually going up, not down. And we did not give up our life to do this. This is one of the side things that I'm doing. In a month, I may spend about three to four hours on this project. That's how much time I allot for this project. With three, four hours, in a month's time, I think it's good enough result. I thought we will plant 114 million trees. We've not gotten there. We are near 20 million. It's still a long way to go. But for three, four hours of investment, it's good enough. That means management must be good, isn't it? Because it is not management. It's a big love affair. People are in love with you. They will do it. They will not fall in love with you unless you fall in love with them. That's the secret. <laughs> You have to do it first. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm in the process of setting up a new initiative called My Drop in the Oceans. And the idea of My Drop in the Oceans is to help people to describe and to define their own drop in the oceans in terms of their own impact on the environment, the positive, uh, the, 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 the services that we benefit from from the environment. I just wonder, those drops can be a multitude of actions, or you could describe them as one accumulation of actions. I just wonder how you would describe your own drop in the oceans. See, the action has to be focused. If it's a multitude of actions, it will not go anywhere. One of the most important things that's needed is any number of individual human beings are doing wonderful things. But the problem is they can't scale it up simply because... They do it their own way. Now, we got to do it the way it works, not our own way, not my way, not your way. We just have to learn to do everything the way it works. 
not my way or your way. There is no my way and your way. There is a way of the world. We have to do it that way. There is a way of this planet. We have to do it that way. Only then we will be a sustained success. Otherwise, my way and your way is ambition, which is destroying the world. Vision means we do it the way it works. If we do it the way it works, we'll all do it the same way. Then there is no problem. If you do it my way and your way, then there is a problem, isn't it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here.